I think all of us have the experience of anxiety. And by anxiety, I mean a, something in our mind that we can't stop thinking about and it's not good. It's something that we think could happen or something that we think about that did happen. It might be to do with something that there is very little likelihood of happening or it may be something that there's a really strong likelihood of it happening. And we'll all be on a different spectrum. Some of us can manage anxiety to quite a high level. We can hold and carry quite a lot of anxiety. Others of us, uh, it's a different place. But we all, I think, have this experience of saying, I need to let go of that. I need to move on. It may be that you're going, I have no idea what you're talking about. Well, I suspect that you've just got a very low threshold or you're so anxious that it's normal. I don't know. One or the other. I want to show you a cartoon. And um, the guy's having this intrusive thought, this worry, this thought about what could happen, has happened, will happen, might happen. And uh, he wants to stop thinking about it. Because the problem with anxiety is that it is not the current thing it's something from the past or the future that's troubling the current and it's spoiling the present. So he says, just let it go. Uh, don't look at it. Fight it, fight it, fight it. And that may be something that many of us experience. We think, I need to stop worrying about school tomorrow. I need to stop worrying about work. I need to stop worrying about what that person thinks of me. I need to stop worrying about what I said. I need to stop worrying about what that person posted or said to me or texted me with or uh, left a comment on. I need to stop worrying about the news. I need to stop worrying about my health. I need to stop worrying about my job. I need to stop worrying about my relationship status. Whatever it is, fight it, fight it, fight it. And uh, uh, he says, these thoughts aren't you. How do we know what God might be saying? We looked at that a couple of weeks ago. Or how do we know when it's just stuff that's coming and, it, and it's not really who we are? These thoughts aren't from you, God, or these thoughts aren't real. Stop. He says, I'm exhausted. And the child says, but you haven't done anything yet. He says, you have no idea, kid. Adults are weird. And there will be people among us who are exhausted by anxiety. We're exhausted by it. We want to be at peace. We want to be able to move on. That may be for some of us a common experience for others of us. It's a season and a thing that happens from time to time. But it is exhausting. It is tiring. Uh, I was listening to a podcast a few weeks ago when I was doing one of my walks, uh, and it was an interview with a lady called Karen Gordon, and she was talking about anxiety. She says, unnecessary and damaging anxiety is usually caused by the thoughts of one of three things. And she listed the three things, and I'm going to show you what they When she initially said this, I thought, no, I don't agree with that. That's not... Those aren't the three things. But I've pondered it, and uh, she might be onto something. She does say usually, so it's not 100%. Um, but then I thought about the things that make me anxious. One of three things. See what you think. This is for you to debate, discuss when you go uh, to the pub tonight and you want to talk about something. Um, discuss this. Unnecessary and damaging anxiety is usually caused by thoughts of one of three things. Number one, perfectionism, a fear of failure. We want it done exactly right. We don't want anybody to laugh at us. We don't want uh, 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 to get it wrong. We don't want to feel guilt. We don't want to feel shame. And connected to that is the second one, which is insecurity, which is a fear of rejection. And so much of the time, we're trying to be perfect and we're trying to be accepted. And all of the time, that creates great anxiety. What have I done wrong? How are people responding to me? What are people thinking of me? What are people saying about me? Have I done this right? Could I do it better? Could it be better? And the third one is control, which is the fear of the unpredictable. 
How do I make sure that tomorrow doesn't bring something I'm not prepared for, I'm not uh, able to handle, um, that isn't the way I wanted it to be? So lots of us live trying to battle all the time perfectionism, insecurity, and control. And we're going to talk about peace this evening. We're going to talk about peace uh, from John chapter 20. John chapter 20 is after the resurrection. If you were with us a couple of weeks ago, you may remember that we looked at what happens when uh, Jesus has been laid in the tomb and Mary, some other women, they go to look for the body. They can't find the body. And so uh, they rush to tell the disciples and John and Peter run back with them and they go in and sure enough the body's gone. They can't see anything so they disappear. And we discussed the question, how do we know the voice of God in the midst of anguish? We discussed that question because Mary doesn't recognize who Jesus is. She thinks it's the gardener until he says her name. And that's uh, available if you, want, if you want to subscribe to the podcast, you can get it, listen to it when you're driving or walking or sleeping. Uh, if you want to watch the YouTube, uh, the video of it, it's all available uh, through our YouTube channel or our uh, website. We'll link you there. So we're going to pick it up. What happens is that uh, the disciples have gone um, and the women are there. Mary has this experience of Jesus and she goes at the command of Jesus to tell the men. She has gone and she has told the men Jesus is alive and that she's met him. And this is where we pick it up at verse 19. On the evening of that first day, so uh, 12 hours later, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders. I want to just highlight it wasn't one door. It wasn't just, oh, we shut the door behind you. Shut the door behind us. It's a barn here. We need it. No, the doors, plural, were locked. Have you done the downstairs one? Have you done the back door? Have you done the French window? Not that they have French windows, but do you know what I mean? It's really intense and intentional. They are shutting themselves deliberately away because they are afraid of the Jewish leaders, the people who have taken Jesus to the Romans and instructed him to be crucified. And I want to just explore then what their fear was and uh, what we might learn from the way Jesus responds to their fear. This isn't a total definition of fear or a total definition of how God, Jesus brings peace, but there are some things that may be helpful for us. Firstly, they have been unchanged by the message of resurrection. They have been told that Jesus is alive and that Mary has seen him but they are still locked away for fear. And we may have heard about Jesus, we may have worshipped uh, in, in church for years, but it hasn't quite changed anything. Or it may be that we haven't really grasped the significance of Jesus' defeat of death. We sung about it as Noah has led us. And it may be up here, but it hasn't quite gone to here. So they are unchanged by the message of resurrection. Secondly, I sense that their fear is exaggerated and inflated by others. In other words, it says quite clearly they were together and afraid. There are occasions, it can go either way, can't it? When you're with a group of people and somebody is particularly confident and that confidence spreads and you feel more confident, but a much more common thing is that when you're with somebody who's anxious or fearful, that which you thought was going to be fine, you suddenly start worrying about. And so you, 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 you find that your level of fear or anxiety is being stepped on and built up by each other person commenting, yes, and have you thought about this? Have you seen the news? What's going to happen tomorrow? What's going to happen here? It seems that their being together wasn't particularly helpful. Now, I might have got that wrong. That might not be the case, but that's just how I, I sensed it. They were together and they were afraid. And the consequence of this was they hid. They shut themselves away. They withdrew. They wanted uh, to be in a secure place. Now, it's clear 
that Jesus tells Mary to tell the disciples to go out and tell people that he's alive. And we're going to discover a little bit later on that that clearly was the intention that Jesus says to them. So they were not meant to be locked away and afraid. They were meant to be going out and saying something has happened here. But their fear had robbed them of the courage. And so they withdrew. They got locked in. They got shut in. And they hid. And there was probably a sense, and there is in a sense of, we don't know what the Jewish leaders are going to do. So the only thing we can control is to lock the doors. We don't know how they're going to react. We don't know if they're going to come after us. We're afraid. Perhaps they were afraid because now that Jesus is alive, this makes the whole thing even more scary. And so their powerlessness causes them to, to lock down. They can't predict or control or imagine what's going to happen tomorrow, and so they hide away. And fear exacerbates our sense of not being in control. The things are going to happen to us, and we don't like it, and so we try and bring some sense of, of management of that. And it caused an inertia. They became static. They did nothing. And fear often paralyzes action. And we don't do the things that we know would be wise, that we know would be sensible. And we just hide away, huddle together, lock the doors. Whether it's physically we lock the doors or emotionally, we lock down, I'm afraid. And fear consumes our thoughts. That's what those cartoons were about. It becomes the only thing that we can think about. It becomes the thought that the front end. We wish, as in that cartoon, that we could think differently. But it consumes our thoughts. And all of us know that experience. And I want to say this moment very, very clearly. And I say this a lot, and uh, we hinted at it last week. God created fear for humanity as a gift. The gift of fear is a sensible thing. If you are not afraid of running out into the road, if you're not afraid of the flame or the electric plug, then you're in danger. When we ha have see little children who cannot understand the concept of danger, they are extremely at risk. Fear protects us. Fear is not a sin. Fear is a part of our humanity that God created for our protection. But like lots of parts of our humanity, it can go awry in this broken and damaged world. And it can take over where we become afraid of the wrong things or we become too afraid and it becomes exaggerated. It's a bit like conscience. Our conscience is a gift from God, but it can be damaged and we no longer feel guilty or it can be damaged and we feel over guilty. And fear isn't in itself wrong. It's quite sensible. If I had no fear of speaking here and did no preparation and no thought and no prayer, it would be a disaster. It is fear that drives me to pray. Fear is good at a low level. But when it becomes all-consuming, when it causes us to hide away, when it causes inertia, when it stops us functioning in the way God intended us to do, to function, it is damaging and it blocks hope. And we no longer see a future that's good. And we no longer believe that a better day will come. And that may be lots of our experiences or experiences of those that we're particularly thoughtful of tonight or praying for or aware of. So what caused 
their particular fear? Well, a number of things. Firstly, I want to suggest that they have an expectation of harm. Obviously, they think that the, the, the Jewish leaders are going to come, maybe arrest them, maybe uh, crucify them. They have an expectation of harm. And that's what's caused their fear. But in addition to that, they are suffering, I suspect, from a disillusionment from false expectations. Now, lots of you know that I go on a lot about this. They, as all the people of God at that time, had expected Jesus to come and overthrow the Romans and punish all that was wrong in the society and set them free. That is why they'd welcome Jesus in on, on Palm Sunday. Now, I know that I am months after Easter, but in the world of the Bible, I am a week later. <laughs> Barely a week. In fact, not quite a week. That was the expectation. Jesus is going to come in and he's going to defeat everybody. And their false expectation has led to a trauma that they cannot comprehend why he's been crucified. And what often happens with us is we have a false expectation of God. God is going to answer everything I ask of him. I am never going to suffer. I am never going to have a problem. I am never going to have a difficulty. I am always going to be fit and healthy. I'm never going to grow old. I'm never going to get bald. I am going to be completely wonderful all my life. And it's rubbish. And the moment something of this broken world affects us. A whole dread, a whole of our faith collapses and we go, oh, oh, crikey, then maybe God doesn't exist and he's not going to help me. And we become afraid. We become afraid because our hope was on the wrong thing. It was built on the wrong expectation. They become disillusioned because they began, I say this a lot, they became disillusioned because they began with an illusion that had got this. The illusion was that everything was going to be straightforward. They had not grasped, however many times Jesus had told them, that he was going to be the lamb who took away the sins of the world, that he was going to die in their place, that he was going to be rejected and handed over and crucified. And because they, couldn't, they hadn't expected that, they are now terribly afraid because they can't see what God is really trying to do. And when we have a false expectation of how God's going to work in our life, we, uh, we sort of oscillate between unrealistic denial of problems, which isn't really hope, and when we realize that that was unrealistic, we become afraid. And all of this had bred a belief of their own inferiority and their powerlessness. There was nothing they could do against the Roman Jewish leaders, rather. They were doomed. They were going to be hurt and damaged. And they weren't good enough. They weren't strong enough. And all of that had led into this sense of guilt, that they had failed Jesus, they had run away, that they weren't confident. And even though they were now aware that Jesus was alive, they were probably struggling with their own shame and their own failure. And when you combine fear with guilt, it's a really toxic mix that we feel shamed and we feel we should have more faith and we should have more peace and we should have more joy and we don't, and we failed, and we've run away, and we've locked ourselves in, and the more you lock yourself in, the more rubbish and guilty you feel, and the more rubbish and guilty you feel, the more we lock ourselves in. It's this cycle of damage. And Jesus said, peace be with you. He comes, not to rebuke, not to challenge, not to tell them off, but to grant his peace. Now we know that it was important for him to give them his peace. Some say, well, is this just not a, a sort of bog standard greeting? But it's actually quite clear in what he said 
three or four days before, on the Last Supper in John 14, 15, and 16, which we looked at many weeks and months ago, uh, he says again and again, peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. These things I have spoken to you so that, you might, it might, uh, so that, it, that in me you might have peace. In me you might have peace. Jesus wants us to have peace. His first words aren't, why are you so stupid? His first words aren't rebuke. His first words are peace. It's okay. I want to bring freedom from this cycle of fear and guilt. When people encounter an angel, uh, or risen Jesus, the most common thing that God says is do not be afraid. Not because it's wrong to be afraid, but because God understands it's scary. And he created that reaction in us. As I said last week when we were talking about masculinity and femininity, God doesn't say do not be anxious because it's wrong to be anxious, but because he wants us to be free from it. We need to take the guilt out of anxiety. Jesus wants to bring peace. So what is this peace? This is a transformation by his presence. We're going to see how he being there brings peace. It is an overcoming of the fear. It is not that Jesus or God ever takes away the thing that we're frightened of. Sometimes he does it. I I shouldn't say ever. Sometimes he does, but very often, peace isn't the removal of the problem. It's the strength to go through it. Jesus doesn't say, peace be with you. What I'm going to do is take out all the religious leaders so that you don't need to be afraid of them. Neither does he say, peace be with you. By the way, actually, all of you in the room are going to be imprisoned, and uh, 11 of you, at least, are going to be killed. That, that, That isn't said that either. His peace is not the removal of the problem. His peace is something within that helps people go through the problem. His peace is a freedom from guilt, a freedom from shame, It is the reason he dies, that we might fully, fully understand he is on our side. He is grace and mercy. He is longing to set the prisoners free. Again, guilt is a gift of God. It alerts us to what we're doing wrong, and it brings us back to God to say, sorry, we did a a whole um, call to prayer this morning about confession and the vital uh, release. And, and, And in Psalm 31 or 2, 32, was it this morning? 32, he says, blessed are those who are forgiven, whose transgressions are covered over. But Jesus wants to set us free from being stuck in guilt, like he wants to set us free from being stuck in fear. He wants that to be uh, fear and guilt, things that, that inspire right behavior, not things that characterize us and trap us. He wants us to have a feeling of hope that tomorrow can be different and better and we will come through this. And the problem we are facing is not a terminal brick wall. It is a hurdle we are to go over and can go over. And his peace brings a clarity of thinking. It brings a sense of being able to no longer panic. I'm terrible at panicking in a situation. I need a few minutes to think about something. People, uh, if I'm in a situation where something unexpected happens and I need to think very quickly, I tend to go into uh, liquid brain and I can't deal with it. I need time, a few minutes, 10 minutes, half an hour, and to go away, think about it. Jesus' peace brings clarity. And it brings a resilience and an inner strength. So why then does this happen? After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Why does he say, look, see the scars, see the wound? Why does he do that after the peace? Why doesn't he say, look, guys, it's, it's me. See, I'm risen from the dead now. Here's my peace. 
It seems that the peace isn't a wishful thinking, but it is confirmed by the resurrection. The most important thing he wants them to know is he's coming to bring peace. The evidence and the proof of that is in the resurrection. The peace that he's bringing is not secondary. It's primary. I want you to have peace. We know that because that's the next thing he says. And again, Jesus said peace. And we know that whenever the, uh, the, the Bible repeats something, it's underlining us. It is important that we receive peace. And it, with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Some of you will know that the words breathe and spirit are pretty well the same word. That's why often to distinguish between what spirit, whether we're talking about spirit or breath of the human spirit, the human breath, or whether we're talking about God's spirit, God's breath, when it's God, the word holy is attached, just to tell us it's a significant. Jesus is telling them and doing it. He says, receive my inner power and presence. Receive me in you. And he breathes on them. They need to receive. They need to say, Lord, I'm letting you in. I'm letting your peace and your power and your presence in. He breathes and they receive. We can't sort this stuff out on our own, but we do need to receive. Receive God. The peace is brought by the breath of God, his Holy Spirit. It is a supernatural peace, not a logical peace. There are loads of brilliantly helpful things that humanity has learned and that I've learned and that work for me that deal with my anxiety to some degree. There are loads of things that are useful. But ultimately, they will fall short without a supernatural infilling of the Holy Spirit of God to bring peace. And then the Holy Spirit of God will say to us, now, there are some things I've taught humanity. Will you do these things as well? And so those things are in partnership. We don't just say, God, it's all up to you. He says, yes, okay, I want you to do some things as well. One of the things is to have a day off. Have a Sabbath. Have a rest. We can't just say, Lord, fill me with your Holy Spirit and then I'll work non-stop all the time. There's a partnership. Neither can we say, as long as I have a day off, I will find peace. We need and in filling of God's Holy Spirit, a supernatural encounter. Now, you will notice that I have left a bit out. I've blocked out a bit of what he says between now. He says, peace be with you, and then he says something else. If you know what he says, that's fine. But we might imagine that he says, peace be with you. Some might people would say, peace be with you, and then he tells them off. I told you this, and the second time I'm having to tell you, why won't you listen to me? Why have you got no faith? He doesn't say that. Others will say, well, maybe he says, peace be with you. Let's just uh, uh, spend this moment together. Let's spend time in peace. Let's be um, gloriously happy together for, a, for, for the rest of eternity. He says something which I don't think we often remember that he says at this moment. Because it's a bit of a, a challenge Jesus said, peace be with you. That's the key thing. That's the statement. Now, here's the next part of it. As the Father has sent me, I'm sending you. In other words, I don't want you to stay in this self-absorbed place of contentment. I want you to go out and do something for me. The whole point and why I told the women to come and tell you and why you weren't supposed to lock the doors is I want you to go and tell people that, that I'm alive. I want you to go and sit, spend, share the love of Jesus. I want you to let people know I want you to go out and do that which I've called you for, what I've created. You've come, I've invited you to be my disciple. I've called you to do something, and I want you to go and do it. The call of God, the choice of God is to do something, and all of us are called and chosen 
the places that we are going to be tomorrow, the places we are going to, the people we are going to be with, the colleagues, the clients, the patients, the students, the friends, whether it's school or work or family or neighborhood, God wants us there and he wants us to be our person in that moment. He wants us to bring his love, his wisdom, his grace, his practical care. So peace comes from obeying the call on our lives. We don't receive peace when we stay in church and lock the doors. We receive peace when we go with it and we take it out and we take God's love into the world. And the Holy Spirit is for this task. You will remember perhaps at Pentecost, which is uh, the moment when we, remember, when we look at what happens in Acts later on, a few weeks later in this, and the, 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 the Spirit of God is poured out on the disciples. Why? That they might be witnesses to Jerusalem, where they are, to Samaria, where their enemies are, and to the ends of the earth, where they've never been. We are to take the love of God to the places where we've been planted, to the people we don't like, and to the places we've not yet been. And then he says these words, and if you forgive, and, and again, sometimes people separate this from what's just happened, but it's all one sort of paragraph. If you forgive the sins of anyone, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now, loads and loads is written on this verse, and you can go and find lots of different theories and understandings and explanations, and I haven't got time nor the brain power to explain them all, but I just want to note the relationship between peace and forgiveness and the importance of us forgiving other people. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now, what does that mean? Does it we mean we become the judge? No. What it means is that if we don't live out and enact forgiveness, it won't be received. We have the authority to proclaim forgiveness. That's really important. We are sent out to tell people that they can be forgiven. But if we don't act it out, if we uh, are condemning, if we are unmerciful, if we are ungracious, they won't be able to receive it. I can't say to the world, God loves you and he wants you to be forgiven. He wants you to know you can be forgiven. He wants you to know you can be free. He wants you to know you can be cleansed. But personally, I don't like you and I don't want to welcome you and you've got no part of my church. It's not going to work. We have authority to proclaim forgiveness but it must be demonstrated. And forgiveness will not be received unless it is enacted. So, we are robbed by peace. In a few moments, Noah is going to come and lead us in responding. But we are robbed by peace, by a load of different things. But in the things that are parallels to this passage, I just want to draw your attention to in summary, to remind you of. We are robbed by peace when we have false expectations. We are robbed of peace when we're saying, why isn't this happening? And it's because we began with the wrong expectation. We are robbed of peace when we ignore the resurrection. When we think uh, and say to ourselves, everything has to be fixed today. We're very familiar with the Lord's my shepherd. He will lead us to green pastures. And we go, okay, God, do that today. But the Lord's my shepherd says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. I will walk through death and the shadow. Unless Jesus returns, I will die, I will decay, I will experience grief and loss. I will experience illness. I will experience difficulty. I will experience opposition and persecution. I will be judged and misjudged. I will be. That's life. But he will lead me to still waters. And I will dwell in his house forever. And goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life because Jesus is alive and this life is not all there is and this is not going to all have to be done today some of it will be done when he raises me when life is over and he brings and breathes new life into me 
And peace is robbed when I think I need to solve all of this and I've got all the reliance in my own strength and my own solutions. I've got to solve it. And we're robbed when we try to fix everything. There are good things for us to do, as I've already said, but unless we respond to Jesus and invite him in, we'll be robbed of peace. So we are robbed of peace when we turn away from Jesus and his spirit. And we don't say, Jesus, please fix this. Instead of saying, I can do it, we need to say, Jesus, I need you. And there are all kinds of reasons why we procrastinate, or maybe it's guilt, or maybe we just don't think it's going to work, and we don't ask Jesus. We don't receive his spirit. We don't say, fill me. We don't say, breath of God, come upon me. We try and fix it all in ourselves, and it robs us of peace. And we are robbed of peace when we allow ourselves to become captive and enslaved and trapped in guilt. And we don't receive the message of the cross. We are robbed of peace when we hold on to unforgiveness. Because we can't experience or understand the mercy and grace and forgiveness of God if we do not forgive others. Because at the back of our mind, we will go, God doesn't forgive me because I'm not forgiving that person. That won't be a conscious thought, but it's there subconsciously. And if we hold on to bitterness and resentment and regret and shame, we're robbed of peace. And we're robbed of peace when we run away, when we hide, when we lock the doors, when we batten down the hatches, when we refuse to do anything. When we stop looking out for other people and we start looking inward, we stop having the hope that God will be with us in the difficulty and we start to try and avoid the difficulty. And so our steps for peace from this particular passage I want to encourage us to recognize our fears and to have a hope because of resurrection. Whatever we are afraid of, it may happen, it may not But God promises firstly to be with us and to never leave us and to give us all that we need for that moment. And secondly, that it will be temporary and it will be followed by endless joy and peace. We recognize our fear and we have hope in the resurrection. We seek Jesus and we receive his forgiveness. We say, Lord, I'm turning to you. Will you breathe on me? Will you bring your cleansing? Will you bring your mercy? Will you bring your forgiveness? Will you set me free from guilt and shame? And we go out with love to share that news in the power of his spirit. We say, Lord, fill me. I need a peace that passes, transforms us beyond human understanding. I need a peace that just doesn't make sense to the rest of the world. Just an awareness that you are with me. And so... We proclaim forgiveness and we live out mercy and grace. I'm going to ask Noah to join me and he does that. I want to put some questions on the screen for us uh, to ponder and think about. These are the questions. What are the fears that make us feel locked in? In a few moments, I just want to give space for us to say, God, here it is. Because sometimes what we do when we're locked in is we don't face them, we don't admit them, and these thoughts become bigger unless they're brought to God. So what are the fears that make us feel locked in? That's the first question. The second, what if anything stops us asking Jesus to breathe his peace into us? And I want to invite us to ask God's Holy Spirit to indwell us. And who do we need to go out in love to? Who is God calling us to care for, to pray for, to give to, to serve, to forgive? Who is God calling us this week to go out to tomorrow? And finally, what if anything stops us giving or receiving forgiveness? 
Can we bring that to the cross? What it is that stops us asking God, the shame or the guilt, or what it is that stops us letting go of stuff. 